Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar on in vitro phototoxicity assays that is co-organized by the Institute for In Vitro Sciences, or IIVS, and PETA Science Consortium International. I'm Bridget Rogers. I'm an advisor to the PETA Science Consortium, and I will be co-moderating today's webinar along with Christy Sullivan, the Vice President of Education and Outreach at IIVS. So this webinar is part one in a two-part series. And uh, please also join us for the second webinar, which is going to be on October 11th. There we go. <laughs> Not quite. And so that second webinar is going to cover case studies. And um, if you haven't signed up already, you can please sign up at the link that was just shared in the chat. Um, so uh, at that link that was also shared, the slides from today and a recording from today's webinar are going to be posted uh, later on. All right, so for today we have two speakers who will be presenting an overview of phototoxicity test methods. First, we're going to hear from Dr. Satomi Onoaye from the University of Shizuko, and then we'll hear from Allison Hilberer from IIBS. So everybody is on mute, but you can type any questions that you have into that top toolbar. It's the little chat icon with the question mark. And we're going to take questions at the end, OK? Uh, this webinar platform doesn't show the questions to everyone, so they're not going to be visible, but we will read them out. And please indicate if, you're, if your question is directed to a specific speaker. OK, with that, we will get going. Speaking first today is Dr. Satomi Onoe. Satomi is a professor in the Laboratory of Biopharmacy in the School of Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of Shizuko in Japan. From 1998 to 2007, he was in charge of pharmaceutical research and development at Itoum Foods Inc. and Pfizer Global Research and Development. His recent studies have focused on, first, novel analytical tools for predicting drug-induced phototoxicity of pharmaceutical substances, and second, nano drug delivery systems with improved biopharmaceutical properties. Satomi has published over 250 peer-reviewed papers in top-rated scientific journals, and he has applied for 45 patents on new drug candidates, drug delivery systems, and research tools. Satomi, thank you so much for being here all the way from Japan. Um, I can see that you're sharing screen. Um, so please go ahead when you're ready. Oh, yeah. So can you see my slide? Yeah, it's just not in presentation mode yet. Oh, yeah, great. So many thanks for your kind introduction. So I'm Satomi Onoe from University of Shizuoka, Japan. So I'm here today to talk about the uh, development of ROS assay. It's a kind of the of the in chemical so screening system for hot safety assessment. So my talk will be divided into mainly so five parts. So let me start with the first topics. It's about the so gen general information on the phototoxicity and uh, possible mechanism. So what you are seeing is the schematic presentation of the skin. So as you might be aware, the sun emits, emits the uh, so ultraviolet so radiation. So in the UVA, B, and UVC band. You know, but because of the absorption by the atmosphere's ozone layer, the main ultraviolet radiation uh, that can reach the surface of Earth uh, must be uh, so UVA and visible light. This light can be easily so transmitted through air and grass. And, you know, there is a potent penetration through the ep epidermis. So after dosing, the drug or, so not limited to the drugs, the other cosmetics and the food chemical, anyway, chemicals can be delivered to the uh, skin or eye. And these chemicals uh, might be excited through the absorption of the photon energy uh, from the sunlight then uh, the chemical uh, might be excited. And these excited phototoxin uh, could attack the endogenous biomolecules. 
possibly leading to the phototoxic skin responses. So in this context, so major risk factor for the phototoxicity uh, can be uh, defined as two. The first one is the pharmacokinetic behavior of the test of the chemicals. Uh, in particular, distribution to the UV exposed tissues, for example, the skin and the eye. And most notably, the so photoreactivity of drug, uh, so drug or uh, the, so chemicals would be a, a key consideration for the phototoxic, phototoxic skin responses. So you know there are uh, at least two major role of photochemistry. So first role of photochemistry goes uh, only light that is absorbed can be active in photochemical processes. And second row of photochemistry says a single photon can excite only one electron. Anyway, they mean uh, no light absorption, no photochemical event. It's very simple. So absorption of the UV and visible light and the subsequent photochemical event can be a, a key trigger. Sorry, Satomi, it looks like your mic has cut off. Can you turn your sound back on? Sorry, it looks like your mic might have gone to mute. I, I'm so sorry. Should, should I start the fastest slide? No, just go back one slide, I think. OK, I think. So, okay, so it's a so Yablonsky diagra diagram describing the so energy state of the so excited chemicals. So, uh, okay. So uh, when the drug molecule can abs uh, absorb the photo energy from the sunlight, electron can be prompted from the ground state to the excited state. Uh, depending on its chemical structure. So in, in most cases, the chemical uh, return to the ground state. To return to the ground state, so exciting, excitation energy must be released by uh, internal conversion, the emission of fluorescence and phosphorescence, or generation of kinetic energy. Also, the uh, excited chemical can react with uh, so several types of the biomolecules, like a protein and a membrane repeat and a membrane protein or DNA, possibly leading to the induction of the photoallergy, photoirritation, photogenotoxicity, so respectively. And so most importantly, so oxygen molecule. Uh, can be a predominant acceptor of the excitation energy, and then give rise to the reactive oxygen species, so-called ROS loss, so such as uh, so singlet oxygen and superoxide, which may be uh, one cause, one of the causative agents for the toxic skin responses. Upon this concept, uh, we uh, provided the uh, uh, working hypothesis as two. So loss generated from the photoirradiated chemical may induce a photochemical and a phototoxic reaction. Then uh, we decided to mon monitor the generation of the reactive oxygen species from the photoirradiated chemicals. Then we move on to the next topics about the so loss assay to capture the generation of the loss from the uh, chemicals. 
it's uh, talking about the so analysis. I mean the so both the superoxide anion and the singlet oxygen can be captured uh, with the use of the so specific so substrate. So briefly, so superoxide anion can react with the nitro blue tetrazolium, uh, resulting in the formation of the nitro blue G holomerism. It's a uh, kind of the blue dye. So I mean the increase of the absorption at 560 nanometer uh, would be indic indicative of the generation of the superoxide anion. With respect to the singlet oxygen, uh, this radical species can react with uh, so imidazole, then forming the so intermediate. So this intermediate can react with the RNO. RNO means paranitroso dimethylanilin, so leading to the breaching of the RNO. So the decrease of the absorption at 440 nanometer uh, would reflect the generation of the singlet oxygen. So we already so optimize the assay condition and try to establish a so high throughput screening system. And the, uh, we establish a so standard protocol. Now, so recommended protocol are available in the JackBomb website. So Ross assay was so carried for the uh, 33 uh, phototoxic chemicals and six non-phototoxic chemicals. As you can see, and, and uh, all the so, phototoxic chemicals tend to show the generation of singlet oxygen, superoxide, or both. However, uh, the most non-phototoxic so, chemical did not. There seem to be a clear differences uh, between the so, phototoxic and non-phototoxic chemical. Upon these observations, we can uh, define the tentative threshold to discriminate the non-phototoxic chemical from the phototoxin. Also, uh, I'd like to share the so, interesting data on the uh, benzokine and the benzone. So please take a look at this structure. As you might be aware, uh, they were, uh, they seem to be a potent UV absorber, as evidenced by the potent so MEC value, as you can see. However, you know, uh, both chemicals were less photo uh, phototoxic, and in the Rosace, both chemicals uh, were found to be a very weak sort of loss generator. So these ob observations were in agreement with the clinical observation. So here you can see the summary of the uh, possible phototoxic so cascade. So in the phototoxic event, the drug initially absorbed the so photon energy from the sunlight, then turned to the excited state. However, in most cases, the chemicals return to the uh, ground state through the emission of the kinetic energy. The, sometimes the, uh, the excited chemical can react with the oxygen molecules, then result in the generation of the uh, singlet oxygen superoxide, so-called uh, ROS. You know the ROS act as a so oxidative agent of the biomolecule, so leading to the phototoxic event. So also, uh, the excited chemicals can directly react with the uh, uh, biomolecule, like, like uh, uh, DNA and the protein, then forming the so photoattack. In such a case, uh, so photogenotoxicity and photoallergic event might be occurred. Anyway, so UV spectral analysis has been so widely used for the photo safety testing, you know. So UV analysis could predict the capacity of the test tested chemical to absorb the photon energy. 
In contrast, rosace would be uh, would be indicative of the photochemical reactivity itself. Then we move on to the so next topics about international harmonization. So to clarify the predictive capacity of the loss assay, uh, we uh, try to uh, start a validation testing under collaboration with uh, so Japanese pharmaceutical companies and government. Uh, successfully, we got uh, so positive outcome from the validation testing. Then we start the uh, proposal uh, for the inclusion of the loss assay in the uh, international guidelines. So finally, the loss assay was adopted as the ICHS-10 uh, guideline in 2014 and OECD test guideline number 495 in 2019. So next, uh, I would like to make a brief explanation on the validation testing. So seven uh, laboratories, including uh, so academia and uh, so pharmaceutical, several pharmaceutical company, and and uh, so national research institute are uh, joining. So we carry out. The, so inter and inter laboratory so validation study uh, on the standard protocol for loss assay for hot safety assessment and uh, validation study was thoroughly supervised by uh, Jacoba. You know the major purpose of the present study was to uh, evaluate the uh, transferability of the loss assay and intra and inter laboratory uh, variability. Also the uh, predictive capacity of the loss assay with the use of the two standard chemical uh, like a kinine as a positive control, a benzone as a negative control and 42 coded, coded chemicals. Hmm. So if the chemicals were uh, poorly soluble in the assay buffer, uh, so loss assay uh, can be run under appropriate so dilution. Also, uh, for the validation testing, so two types of, of two types of the solar simulator here you can see were employed. So in laboratory number one to three, so loss assay was conducted using the uh, Atlas Santes CPS Plus. CPS series equipped with the Xenon Arc RAM. You know, the Santos CPS solar simulator has been widely used for the photo safety testing. In laboratory number four to seven, so Seric uh, SXL series was employed for the loss assay, in which the Xenon Arc ramp was uh, installed too. You know, the CERIC so solar simulator uh, is originally so developed for in vitro phototoxicity uh, testing. That was uh, completely compatible with uh, a SOL 500. For both solar simulators, the UV filter was installed to adopt the so spectral pattern of the artificial uh, light source. Uh, to that of the na uh, natural daylight. And both so so uh, solar simulator uh, met, the, met the CIE85 daylight simulation requirement. So here you can see the summary on the uh, predictive capacity of the loss assay. So you can see the number of the laboratory and uh, so detected number of the chemicals. Uh, as you can see, uh, in both groups, the 21 or 22 phototoxins uh, tended to generate uh, so loss and the exposure to the simulated sunlight as long as they were uh, soluble in the assay buffer. In contrast, there appear to be a weak photoreactivity for most non-phototoxic chemicals. 
although uh, some uh, some exhibit is uh, uh, weak photoreactivity uh, in a few uh, laboratories. Anyway, overall, uh, reproducible so prediction could be achieved among participating laboratories. So in both solar simulators, about 70 to 80 percentage of coded chemicals were evaluable in the loss assay at the 200 micro uh, final concentration of the 200 micromolar or under dilution. So most notably, the proposed threshold provided no false negative. Uh, such a high negative predictivity could provide a reliable health safety assessment. And it will be uh, particularly uh, variable as a fast screening to identify the phototoxic potential. So in addition to the UV spectral analysis, the ROS assay uh, is shortly so described in the ICHS-10 guide, guideline too. You know, the uh, S10 guideline says a negative result in this assay uh, conducted under the appropriate condition would indicate very low of probability of hototoxy, blah, blah, blah. So therefore, uh, even though the chemicals high uh, potent UV absorption with MEC value of over uh, 1,000, no further uh, testing would be needed if any loss generation was not seen. So here you can see the so cover page of the so OECD test guideline number 495. So it's a final part. So we would like to propose the so combination use of the loss assay of other uh, in vitro and in vivo data. As I mentioned, Key consideration for the for phototoxicity should be uh, so pharmacokinetics, in particular exposure to the skin or eye. Also, the photoreactivity of test chemical would be uh, so a key consideration too. So then we would like to propose the combination use of the loss assay data and the pharmacokinetic data. And this might provide a more reliable for safety prediction. Uh, to verify that this concept, we carry out uh, so hot safety assessment on phenocyanogens. Uh, as you can see, the eight so phenocyanogens uh, consisting of the three non-halogenated group, uh, sorry for the uh, BG slide, and two fluorinated group, a uh, three chlorinated group. So to clarify the uh, pharmacokinetic behavior, we carry out a cassette dosing pharmacokinetic study in rat. As you can see, there appear to be a clear differences in the systemic exposure after dosing. There also uh, uh, there appear to be a, so different distribution to the skin and eye depending on the structure. As well as the pharmacokinetic data, uh, we clarify the so, photochemical property for all chemicals with the use of the UV spectral analysis and the loss assay. As you can see, the, uh, both chemicals show the high UV absorption. I mean, the MEC value was found to be over 1,000. And in loss assay, uh, they tend to sh show the show the generation of the singlet oxygen. So generation of the superoxide anion is a negligible or very limited. In particular, uh, fluorinated group uh, shows the potent uh, generation of the singlet oxygen. So uh, to predict uh, so phototoxic potential, we combine the photochemical property and the pharmacokinetic data uh, so then we establish a decision matrix. As you, as you can see, the FP uh, exhibited the uh, so potent uh, photoreactivity and potent so distribution to the so UV exposed tissue. So then the phototoxic uh, potential of, of FP would be uh, very high. Anyway, 
uh, here you can see the uh, so rank order of the predicted predicted phototoxic potential. So generally, the so fluorinated so phenocyanins uh, might be uh, highly phototoxic, and the non halogenated uh, group might be uh, less phototoxic. Uh, just for comparison purpose, we carried out the in vivo phototoxic testing in rats. Here you can see the rank order of the observed phototoxicity. Observed phototoxicity uh, would be uh, almost identical to the so predicted one, except for the CP. CP represents for the chlorpromazine. The you know the chlorpromazine uh, undergoes the uh, so severe metabolism after dosing. Uh, most inter interestingly. So meta metabolite of the chlorpromazine still exhibits exhibits a, a high phototoxicity. Yes, and uh, in our pharmacokinetic characterization, we focus on the parent chemicals, not for the so metabolite. This might be a part of a reason for the data discrepancy. In order not to provide the false information, uh, we have to so. Uh, monitor the so metabolite as well as the parent chemicals. Uh, that's uh, our comment. So let me summarize my talk. So we successfully established a uh, so loss assay. Also, that we got uh, so positive outcome from the validation testing. And now the loss assay was adopted as uh, so ICHS10 and OEC test guideline number 495. And finally, we would like to propose a combination use of the loss assay and the pharmacokinetic data, if possible, uh, to provide a more reliable so for safety information. Okay, finally, I would like to say many thanks to our collaborator and the past colleague. Okay, uh, this brings me to the end of my presentation. Many thanks for your kind attention. That's all. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tommy. That was a great overview. Okay, so um, we're going to hold all questions to the end of the next presentation, but please do enter them in if you have them. Um, we have a few in there already. All right. Um, so, Tommy, if you can stop sharing screen, we'll get Allison's screen up. Um, speaking next is Allison Hilberer. Allison is the program leader of the BCOP, Phototoxicity, and 96 Well Assays at the Institute for In Vitro Sciences. She's been working with the photo safety assays for over 15 years, first in conducting the assays in the lab as a biologist, and now as a study director overseeing the photo safety program at IIVS. Allison received her certif certification as a diplomate of the American Board of Toxicology, or DABT, and serves as an expert on the OECD test guideline panel for eye and skin irritation and phototoxicity. Welcome, Allison. Thanks for being here. I see your screen, but it's in um, like the notes mode. Perfect. Please go ahead. Oh, sorry, I'll Allison, you're on mute. On mute. Okay, there we let's go. try this again. <laughs> So thank you, Bridget. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for those of you that are joining from overseas. Um, I'm going to build on Dr. Anwe's presentation today by talking about some new approach methodologies, or NAMs, use, utilizing cell and tissue-based models. And Dr. Anwe uh, discussed a little bit about this, but not all compounds need to have photo safety testing, and there are key components that would require us to consider that, and absorption and exposure are two of those. So on the left, you see a graphic of chlorpromazine, which is a known photo irritant, and this is the absorption over uh, a spectral scan of up to 800 nanometers. And that covers the UV as well as visible light. And so one of the key triggers we need to have is absorption between 290 and 700 nanometers. And you can see here the chlorpromazine does. In addition to that, the absorption has to be considered significant. And that significance is measured by the MEC or molar extinction coefficient. 
And if that's greater than 1,000 liters per mole per centimeter, then it's considered significant and would require further testing. And you can see for the chlorpromazine, Allison, um, yes. Allison, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but your screen switched back to presenter mode. Um, oh. Is that better? <laughs> there we go, yep. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so you can see for the chlorpromazine, we have an absorption peak of around 305 nanometers. And then finally, we have to have exposure to the skin or eye. Uh, is it a systemically applied material that would then be distributed to the skin or eye? In terms of terminology, there's a general umbrella term of photosensitization, which really covers all light-induced tissue reactions. And underneath that umbrella um, is photoallergy or an immune-mediated response upon exposure to the test compound and then subsequent exposure to light. And this can be a lasting uh, event that can occur. On the other hand, there's phototoxicity or photoirritation, which is an acute light-induced tissue response to a photoreactive chemical. And this is something that once the offending compound is removed, the reaction can go away. And it is likened to a clinical manifestation of a sunburn. And all of these definitions were taken directly from the ICHS-10 photo safety document. Dr. Anwe already presented this uh, in, in much greater detail, but when we're thinking about phototoxicity, we're essentially looking at the potential for a compound to become more reactive or toxic in the presence of light. So let's say that we have an ingredient, it absorbs at 350 nanometers, and we apply it to the skin and the ground state, everything is fine, but as soon as we have UV exposure, that material gets excited, and in the process of going from the excited state back down to the ground state, we end up with the creation of ROS, DNA damage, damage to our cell membranes or different components within those cells. In thinking of the 3T3 and reconstructed human epidermis or RHE assay, um, the assays are very similar in terms of the steps. Uh, they start with the test article exposure. We're going to have duplicate tissues or duplicate plates exposed to different concentrations. Half of our treatments get exposed then in the presence of light, and half of them get exposed in the absence of light. After that, the treatments are removed. They'll undergo an overnight post-exposure incubation period where the viability will be assessed using the Nutrite uptake dye or the MTT. And thinking about the data, we're looking at the viability comparisons between the tissues or cultures in the presence and absence of that UVA invisible light. So you can see the 3T3 cells in the absence of light have taken up a lot of Nutred. You can also see there's many, many cells in there to be able to take up that Nutred. In comparison, when we have the cells that were exposed to that same concentration in the presence of light, now there's a lot less cells, so a higher level of cytotoxicity. And very similarly with the RHT phototoxicity assay, those tissues are viable and they've converted that yellow MTT to a purple dye indicating viability whereas the tissues exposed to that same concentrations in the presence of light, now you see a lot more reduced um, amount of MTT available by those tissues. I thought it was important to talk a little bit about the 3T3 Nutrid Uptake Phototoxicity Assay updates that were prepared in 2019 for the test guideline. Um, the initial test guideline was in 2004, so 15 years of running the assay and learning more and more about it. And one of the key components uh, that was changed was the MEC trigger was increased from 10 liters per mole per centimeter to greater than 1,000. And this was based on work from Bauer and Henry and others. And this is also presented in the ICH S10 photo safety document. And they found that essentially increasing that threshold would still be able to capture appropriately those materials that would pose photo safety risks and also minimize the number of compounds that may have been tested that might not necessarily have needed it if we use that greater than 10 threshold. There was also some additional guidance provided on solubility and solvents in terms of how do we address um, materials that may not be particularly soluble as a dilution-based assay. That's always an important component to assure solubility and bioavailability of that test compound to our test system. There was some harmonization with other test guidelines and regulatory documents for photo safety, namely the ICHS-10, which uh, evaluates for uh, pharmaceuticals. 
And two of those were the max concentration consideration instead of the thousand, which is presented in the test guideline for materials that are systemically administered, perhaps that could be lower to 100 as data has shown that that would still be acceptable. And in addition to that, the prediction model, which has the middle ground of a probable phototoxicity potential, maybe that's not relevant for systemically applied materials. There were also some additional procedural clarifications regarding um, things to look out for and preparation of red, the solar simulator, the UV meter, as well as um, cell sensitivity checks. In moving from a mono layer from the three T3 cells to our tissue model, um, we go from a very simplistic system of the valve C3 T3 mouse fibroblasts to a multi-layer constructed tissue model of the RHE. And that tissue model is made up of viable cells that have grown to air liquid interface. And so the exposure parameters may be slightly different. We now also can increase our applicability in terms of what kinds of materials we can test and how we can test them. In 2021, the test guideline for the RHE phototoxicity assay was adopted. And then two years later, this past July, uh, an update was made and the update essentially clarified some of the reference compounds and some of the terminology to be more harmonized with the other guidelines. The RHE assay offers many advantages over the monolayer, and one of those is overcoming the limitation of solubility presented in the 3T3 assay. Um, we have a number of different solvents that we can use, and we can also deal with materials that may not be completely soluble with a three-dimensional tissue model. There's also going to be flexibility in our exposure conditions. Um, the, the 3T3 cells, uh, the UVB can uh, actually uh, cause some toxicity, and the RHE model is actually much more tolerant to UVB. So if we needed to incorporate UVB into our exposures uh, because our materials are maybe UVB absorbers only, we can now do that with the RHE model. We can also model a topical and systemic application. Normally materials are applied directly on top of the tissue model onto the stratum corneum, but in some cases we may also wanna understand systemically how they might affect uh, the tissues. And so in those cases, we can apply the treatments directly into the culture medium underneath the cells. We also have flexibility in terms of the exposure time. Uh, this would be more applicable in cases where we're not necessarily following the test guideline. Uh, we may be looking at cosmetics, for example, uh, or materials that have high levels of cytotoxicity. Instead of the standard 18 to 24 hour exposure, we might reduce that exposure time to minimize the cytotoxicity and allow us to have a more appropriate evaluation of phototoxicity potential. We can all also model end use applications. So final formulations can be tested because this models the outermost layer of human skin, it may also be appropriate in many situations. And the assay not only addresses hazard, but also risk. And there will be more discussion on this next week in the presentations. For those of you that may not be as familiar with the reconstructed human epidermis or RHE, this is a model that's grown at air liquid interface so that we have viable cells grown onto a tissue membrane. And then we have, in this case for the epiderm, uh, a viable, viable cells with a functional stratum corneum. And you can see on the left, this is uh, an Epi 200 from MatTech epiderm model. And that's the tissue insert with, um, in a six wall plate. You can see the medium underneath that would be providing the nutrients to the cells uh, throughout the exposure periods and incubation periods. And then on the right hand side, we also have the graphic representations of that picture. And below is uh, a cross section of histology showing our tissue membrane. And you can see within that membrane, we have basal spinous and granular layers of cells that have differentiated essentially to then form the stratum corneum, which is the functional barrier property of the cells. With the test guideline, there are several preliminary assessments that have to be considered, uh, starting with solubility. The maximum concentration outlined in the test guideline is 10%. And this is important not to exceed this because some materials can act as UV filters. There are several suggested solvents presented in the test guideline, including Delbeco's phosphate buffered solene, 
HBSS, sesame seed oil, mineral oil, ethanol, or an acetone olive oil mix, and others might be considered. And I'm going to show you later on how we might go about the process of essentially qualifying other solvents to be considered. There's also a colorant control test. And this is going to answer the question if the test article could cause interference with our optical density reading. You can imagine a material that is dark colored, maybe purple or red, and it penetrates into the tissue, could be extracted with our tissues and give us a false reading. So if we do find something is a colorant control, we can include colorant control tissues, which are essentially viable tissues that are treated similarly without MTT at the endpoint. And then we also want to run a direct MTT reduction test. The direct MTT reduction test will help us understand if the test article can directly reduce MTT by itself. Again, if the test article penetrates into the tissues and is interacting with the MTT tubes, the endpoint of the assay, it could also result in a false signal. So if we do notice that we have MTT direct reduction, then we would include kill control tissues, which are essentially tissues that are made non-viable through a freeze-thaw process. And those would be handled similarly as our viable tissues. There's also consideration for HPLC or UPLC in both of those instances, and there's more guidance on that in the test guideline. A little bit more detail for the RIT phototoxicity assay. We're going to start with our dosing in three to five concentrations. Each concentration gets duplicate for a UVA or dark exposure, and that will be exposed to the tissues for an 18 to 24 hour period. After that period, half of our treatment group will go to the UVA exposure for a total of six joules per centimeter squared of UVA light, and then the other half will be exposed in the dark. The treatments are removed, and then an overnight incubation occurs for 18 to 24 hours, and then the viability is assessed with our MTT endpoint. And you can see the extraction process looking at the different tissues exposed in the presence and absence of light. With the data, we're starting with the percent right relative viability by taking our optical density value of our test article treatment exposed in the presence of light, for example, and then that would be divided by our optical density of our negative or solvent control also exposed in the presence of light. And we can then take that information, and you can see in the middle graphic of our chlorpromazine as an example, our viability over our concentration in bar graphic form. So the solid boxes would indicate the exposures in the absence of light, and then the lined boxes in the presence of light. So you can see at the 0.002% concentration, we have similar viabilities indicating no phototoxicity potential. And you can see with the tissues, both of them appearing to have that dark purple coloration. In comparison, at 0.02%, we now have an increase in toxicity in the presence of light, in this case about 65%, and this here would indicate phototoxicity potential. According to test guideline 498, we have a number of factors to consider when we're evaluating phototoxicity. And I think this chlorpromazine dose response is a very good example of highlighting each of those components. So if I have my viability over my concentrations of chlorpromazine, you can see we have a dose response as we increase our concentrations in the presence of light. And even at the point where we have 0.064 as our concentration of chlorpromazine, we now have complete cytotoxicity. So if we're making evaluations of our concentrations, we need to ensure that we have viability that's sufficient, or at least 35% in our non-irradiated tissues. And you can see at 0 0.002, 0 0.006, and 0 0.02, we have sufficient viability to be able to make appropriate comparisons for phototoxicity. We also have to have at least one concentration that's at least 30% different that would indicate phototoxicity potential. And you can see at 0 0.006 and 0 0.02, we have achieved that. But for the 0 0.006, this is considered borderline because that concentration is 35%. So something would be considered borderline if the viability was 30 plus or minus 5%. However, since we have at least one concentration that is not borderline and is greater, this would indicate phototoxicity potential for this material. A number of controls have to be in place as well, starting with the test system. 
uh, it's expected that there's quality control checks for the developer of the assay, and that may include testing for the sensitivity and also barrier function. And those can be achieved looking at historical databases within the developers uh, at their negative controls, having a certain optical density, as well as using benchmark irritants like SLS or Triton to evaluate the barrier function of the tissue batches. Each assay that we run in the laboratory should have a positive control, which is identified in the test guideline as chlorpromazine at 0.01 or 0.002%. And we also want to include negative and vehicle controls, and that would include whatever vehicle or negative control you're using for preparation of your test compounds. For a valid test, our controlled tissue replicates must be within 20% of each other. Our optical density of our negative or vehicle control must fall within a range of 0.8 to 2.8 for the epiderm. And our control tissues must be within 80% compared to our non-irradiated tissues. And then finally, the positive control must have a positive prediction. I mentioned we could consider additional solvents and IIVS has taken an approach in qualifying solvents for consideration. And the first is to take those solvents and evaluate them themselves to see if we have phototoxicity potential or not. And you can see that our percent viability over five different prospective solvents, uh, polyethylene glycol, DMSO, acetone, or ethanol, uh, they look very similar in terms of the responses of just the solvent alone. So we have indicated no phototoxicity, and ideally we shouldn't see any cytotoxicity or minimal of that. And in the case of polyethylene glycol, you can see there is a slight increase in cytotoxicity compared to the other solvents. In addition to that, we want to make sure that the solvent still has the ability to detect a photoirritant. And that could be achieved by preparing our positive control, 0.02% chlorpromazine, in each of those solvents. In this case, it's also important to compare with our established controls. And I should mention that in each of these graphics, the purple 1% DMSO and HBSS is our standard control. So in comparison, comparing our solvents as well as our colopromazine in the solvents, you can see very similar responses and all of those could be qualified as additional solvents for use in the assay. A couple additional considerations uh, regarding the test guideline. One thing you might wanna consider is a preliminary screening assay. We test up to 10% for materials that may be highly cytotoxic, you may not be able to achieve sufficient viability in the absence of light. So it could be ideal to consider first casting a wide net and then later coming back and honing on concentrations of interest. Also, there's the consideration of the rinsing procedures. Typically, this is done after exposure to light. But in some cases, you may have potential for interference if the material is dark or opaque. The overnight exposure is sufficient for penetration into the tissues, and so if you do have to rinse, it may still be appropriate. And this is especially appropriate when we're talking about cosmetics. And I'm going to wrap the presentation up today talking about mixtures and formulations because that's always been a topic of interest. Uh, the RHE phototoxicity assay has been around for over 20 years. It went through a pre-validation in the late 90s, and so it's been used for non-regulatory purposes by many different industries for decades. Uh, specifically, cosmetics is often used that. And there's a couple approaches, a multi-dose approach, considering relevant concentrations that might be included in the cosmetic, as well as a single-dose approach, which the final formulation could be evaluated. The pharmaceutical industry also mentions this in the ICH S10 update in 2015, that there could be some examples for topically applied dermaceuticals, for example, or those that are primary UVB absorbers that the RHE model may be more relevant for use. And then finally, in terms of risk, this could be part of a tier testing approach uh, in terms of looking at no effect levels for phototoxicity potential. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions later on, uh, here's my contact information that you can reach out to me. Thank you very much. Here's the references. Um, well, thank you, Allison. Um, and thank you, Satomi. Those were really wonderful presentations, both of you. 
Um, so we'll move on to the Q&A. Uh, we actually have quite a few questions, so thanks everyone for being so active. Um, and as long as it's okay with both of you, we might actually go over the end time just so we can get to some of these questions and then people, if they need to leave, can, can see their recording online. Is that, uh, does that work for both of you? Yes. Okay. Um, so we'll start with a question for, um, for Dr. Onway. Um, yeah. it's, a, it's a pretty straightforward question. What is the significance of the MEC value? Oh, yeah. So the, it's uh, about uh, so criteria to discriminate a phototoxin from the non-phototoxic chemical. So Dr. Brian Henry so is a, a past colleague in the Pfizer. They collect the, so a number of the data in, with respect to the UV spectral data. Uh, upon these so data, they found uh, uh, one con con come to the conclusion that the molecule with the MEC value of less than 1,000 seem to be a less phototoxic. So then it's just a so criteria. However, if the chemical has a so potent uh, MEC value over 1,000, it doesn't matter as long as uh, uh, they have no potential to generate a reactive oxygen species. Yes. Thank you. Um, question for Allison. How do you check barrier function? Any uh, specific protocol that you use? Um, you could use a time to toxicity using um, in a known irritant like Triton or SLS uh, and looking at multiple either concentrations of that or you could look at different exposure times and establish a database of what is expected for that particular um, tissue model. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and it, this came in for both of you. Um, well, I think it's relevant to both of you. So we'll, we'll start with uh, Dr. Onoe and, and go to um, Ms. Hilberer. How do you calibrate your UV meter? Do you measure both UVA and UVB in the test system? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the Rosasa is a cell-free system. So uh, then the, we can use the both so, uh, UVA and UVB. Uh, but uh, so just for the 3 t 3 NRU phototoxic testing, so UVB must be uh, so harmful for the so cell system. Uh, then the, we have to so install the so appropriate UV filter to avoid the so UVB radiation. Yeah. Okay. Great. And and Allison, did you have anything to add? Um, we at, at IIVS, we send our UV meter out for calibration um, to an outside source, um, and they have an expected range of when that should fall in. Um, mm -hmm. We also will do our checks every time that we run the assay um, before and after, and that would be for the UVA. Uh, we haven't found an appropriate UVB meter, and so one thing that we've been able to do is we have an analysis of our, an analysis of our light performed. Um, in periodic time points. And at that time, the vendor is able to determine the amount of UVB output. And so then we can essentially estimate that based on the exposure conditions. Okay, great. Uh, another question for uh, Dr. Onway, is the Ross assay protocol amenable to test samples with unknown molecular weight mm. or mixtures? Oh yeah, uh, that's a tough question for me that we <laughs> have considering that, so this program. Uh, to be honest, so we already published the two paper uh, for this solution. I mean, the, uh, we carry out the so Ross assay on the, so a number of, of the uh, harbor medicine and uh, essential oils. And we found that the Ross assay at the uh, 50 microgram per milliliter uh, seem to be so effective for the uh, for safety prediction. If you, uh, so audience uh, might be interested in the, this outcome, please uh, see my so published paper. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. 
Um, and, and maybe we can actually add those, those, uh, the, the links to those papers to our, um, to the web page where the recording will be and that way people can find them. Mm -hmm. um, so a question for Ms. Hilber. Um, with regards to the UV vis spectra, do we consider absorber maxima only, or is it MEC greater than a thousand at any wavelength that's considered a risk? I don't know if, if you can see that question. It's a kind of a long one. I don't want to read it all at once. I think one of the the key triggers is that MEC value of of greater than a thousand within the 290 to 700 nanometers is really the, the key component in terms of additional testing needed. Um, I think that you can gather information in terms of where that absorption occurs, and it's, that's always helpful in terms of if it's a UVB predominantly absorbing, uh, that gives us a better idea of maybe the consideration to run the RHE model instead of the 3T3, although the, the 3T3 can still pick up some of those because it, the UVB is attenuated, but a small amount still can come through with some of those filters that are used. Thank you. Um, okay, so actually, let me. Ah, uh, yeah, here's a good one. Um, for 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 Dr. Seth, uh, Anuay, is it yeah. okay to use test guideline 495 alone to predict phototoxicity? I know you addressed that a little bit with your um, later slides. Um, this person is uh, interested in doing that alone instead of together with uh, the MRU, the 3T3 assay. Is that mm -hmm. any comments mm -hmm. about that? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, from uh, in, in my opinion, so the loss assay alone can be uh, so predictable, uh, so can be available for the host safety prediction. However, to increase the uh, so reliability of the so uh, prediction capacity and combination use of the uh, loss assay data and uh, so 3T3 data and any other so data would be uh, of great help. So currently, I'm working on the so IATA, the new OECD pro project. Okay. Yeah. So right. the, the documentation is almost completed. We have a, a so expert review, and I made a, so correction in accordance with the, so all the comment. I think the pub, we we are moving on to the so public comment on the next year. So after that. The, uh, the so combination use of the in vitro screening system, including the loss assay, would be open. Yeah. Great, great. That actually answers another question that was in the queue for you. So, um, Allison, anything to, to add to that? Or no, I think I think Dr. Anue covered that well. Okay. Um. Okay, so for, for Allison now, in the RHE phototox assay, how are the tested concentrations selected? Does the type of product or expected use of the product taken into account for dose selection? I think some of it can depend on um, what we're testing for. So, for example, in cosmetics, it may be recommended to think about what the at-use concentrations are going to be um, and then maybe test some concentrations higher and maybe some lower, so flanking that target concentration. Uh, the test guideline does indicate a maximum concentration up to 10%, and so there could be some risk if you tested at lower concentrations and you didn't achieve uh, the, the full cytotoxicity, for example, to ensure that up to 10%, you don't have that potential for phototoxicity. Um, and this is where maybe the dose range finding assay using multiple concentrations with a, a large dose range, and then coming back later and selecting um, concentrations that may occur where we see differences happening. I know that next week's presentations, I believe, will cover a little bit of this. Uh, and there's 
other ways that people are looking at this in terms of applying safety factors, for example, with the at use concentration that they would be expecting for use. Okay. Um, a question back to the solar simulator. This is for Satomi. Um, uh, it, it's asking about the UVB radiance uh, less than 300 nanometers does not look to be present. Could this limit the use of the investigation of drugs or chemicals that absorb in the low UVB range of, you know, 290 to 300 mm -hmm. nanometers? Yeah, uh, so that's a very so important point. So as I mentioned, the ROSAS is a cell-free system. So then the, we can uh, apply the, so the UVB radiation to the so Rosace buffer. So yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, maybe uh, another sort of uh, testing strategy question for for Allison. Can levels for the molar extinction coefficient, MEC, be used as a threshold below which testing would not be needed? I think if we're going strictly by the, the guidance that's provided in the test guidelines and also other regulatory documents and the work from Bauer and Henry and others, I think the something less than 1,000 wouldn't require testing. But I, I think if somebody wanted to test, they certainly could could do that to confirm that there is anything, but I think generally it's it's the trigger is, is greater than a thousand, and so anything below that would not need further testing. Okay, cool. Um, a couple of these questions I think are going to be covered next week, so um, hopefully they'll be able to join then as well, and and we've sort of. They're around, you know, uh, testing strategies, which I think sounds like is, is coming uh, more guidance in terms of how to um, do any, uh, you know, address specific chemicals and, and do any sort of testing strategies uh, is coming from the OECD. Um, let me just... One last question. Um, so for Dr. Anwe, yeah. regarding the discrepancy of the prediction for chlorpromazine in the Ross assay, mm -hmm. is the in vivo data correctly predicting the phototoxicity? And is this correlated to human? I think they're asking. Oh, yeah. In vivo, mm. the one is right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think so. That's a, so. It's uh, so challenging to to connect uh, so the uh, the animal testing to the so clinical data directory. But uh, yeah. I hope the uh, yeah uh, so animal the outcome from the animal testing will be uh, so com comparative to the yeah clinical data. Yeah. Right. right. Okay. Something to watch out for always. Um. And uh, maybe one more question for, for both of you. We'll, we'll start with Allison first. Um, as you, uh, there was an example of a chemical that was uh, positive in vivo, but negative in vitro. Could this be captured by adding a bioactivation step like incubation with S9? I am not familiar with anyone doing that in the, the photo safety arena, but I'm sure that it can happen. I've seen um, discussions of that with skin sensitization, for example, of uh, the metabolites being the actives. Um, I think in general, there's commentary that, that the metabolites generally don't pose photo safety risk, but I think that there's certainly, with all the, the new chemistries coming out, there, there could still be potential for that. Great, thank you. And so tell me anything to add? Oh yeah. So from understanding the uh, in the ICHS 10 guideline, uh, they uh, don't so recommend the so testing on the metabolite. Yeah. However, you know the uh, for example the 
amino labric acid. Just after dosing the amino labric acid, and they are uh, uh, transformed to the so, porphyrin. So then, the, after metabolism, they get uh, so the photoreactivity. In such a case, uh, uh, we have to so, uh, so take care of the so metabolism for reliable health safety prediction. It's my opinion. Okay. Well, I um, want to thank you both for your presentations. Uh, that was a really nice overview and kind of an update for all of us on the state of the science. Um, I just uh, want to also thank uh, our hosts, Bridget, uh, and all of you for uh, your attention for the last hour. Uh, make sure to register for next week's session where we'll demonstrate the use of these assays in some case studies. Thanks again to uh, Allison and to Tomei. Um, take care and uh, have a great evening or, or rest of your day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Christy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care.